And welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to the monastery, the open bar of the internet, the world's greatest shit show, and the place where we, the good brothers and sisters of this most holy of temples, seek enlightenment through the drunkest, craziest, and most batshit ways possible. I am your one and only gaming monk, better known as Mildra, and with me I have a newcomer into the temple, creator of the upcoming Inher Inheritors Art... RPG slash skir slash skirmish war game, and the head and the headman of Lionborn Publishing, who's responsible, f who's responsible for Feet First into Hell, the one and only L R Knight. Hey, how you doing today, man? I'm doing good. I had a good time with my daughter today. So we were, uh, we were, I was just saying, we we're exploring all over one of the local cities, and uh, she's a little little, so she can't walk a lot on her own, but we. She got her steps in today, so I had a good day. Mm -hmm. Though, from what we, from what you said before we went live, you had you had made the mistake of doing leg day at the wrong at the wrong time. Oh, it's always the wrong time for leg day. But I, I switched up my routine recently. Me and my me and the guys that I, I game a lot with, we also lift together, and uh, we're dialing in on programs. And I went way too hard this weekend. So even a couple days in, like I'm waddling around. You know, my daughter. Right on my shoulders, so I'm feeling every single step. But I like it, and I won't complain. And because I bike everywhere, everywhere for me is leg day. Fair um, enough. Just as just as long as I don't have to, tr just as long as I don't have to try and do um burpees. I know how to do them, but they are an exercise that is not that is not made for people of my height. Fair enough. Yeah, are you you pushing seven foot or more than six foot or because I hit one of the guys we six game six. With, okay, one of the guys we game with is six ten. He was six eleven, but I think he's six ten now, and I think he'd probably say the exact same thing. So, I used to love bicycling, and then I bought a motorcycle, and it's really hard to work up the justification to get on a bicycle when I can go way faster and look look a lot cooler. Oh. I love my motorcycle. Well, I'm surrounded. I'm surrounded by woods everywhere, so I don't have to worry about. Lo I don't have to worry about people about looking cool for pe for people when there's barely anybody around. That's true. I mostly look cool for myself. I don't have a huge bike. I've just got a a good bike. So, mm -hmm. but uh, it's, season's almost over. I think we're about to have one little warm spell in upstate New York where I am, and uh, and then I think the bike's going to have to go in the shed. I'm in the I'm in Minnesota, so make of that what you will. Have you had frost yet? Not yet. Okay. My my one of my family members is just north of Chicago, and they got their first frost last week, and that was like, well, that's the end of festivities. So I do always la I do always laugh whenever my southern friends come up, come up to visit and get their and get that first blast of cold air. Oh yeah. Oh. Or in or in some kit, or whenever whenever one of those freak winter storms hit hits the it's the south and I see all everybody over there panicking. <laughs> oh, on one hand, I understand the panic. There's not really the infrastructure for it. Right, right. Yeah, no plows. They don't have salt piles sitting everywhere like we do, just waiting. Yeah. On the other hand, when you have to deal with endless amounts of po of poking, because. And the and the ha ha we're it's nice and it's nice and warm up down here and you're and you're up there freezing, yeah I'm gonna take my licks I'm gonna take my chance to take to give the receipt any chance I get. Yeah, fair enough. I've in upstate New York we get hammered with snow and eh, we got about two weeks of good weather left and then I won't see the sun again until maybe mid March. Mm -hmm. Pretty heinous. We get Great Lake weather. We don't get the plains, the plains cold wind. Mm -hmm. I'm well aware of that, having spent a good amount of time in Ohio and Illinois. But we get hammered with snow, and it's they're saying it's an El Nino winter, so we're gonna have a lot of good gaming sessions this winter because there's not gonna be a whole lot else to do. And unfortunately, there's not enough lakes to do ice fishing. Yeah, yeah, I'm not really a fisherman. I'm outdoorsy, but I'm not. I've never really got the fishing bug. Oh, the f the fishing bug is crazy over here to the point where 
the fishing opener may as well be a state holiday. <laughs> That's how hunting season is where I am. We're in uh, we're in bow hunting season right now, and I like I before I work in education, and I can see the kids that are absent. And if I go and I look at the DEO uh, webpage or the DOE webpage, I I know exactly why they're absent. It has nothing to do with a sore foot. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So. With that, with that said, it's tradition to go into the humble beginnings, in a sense. So, walk me through your first introduction to role-playing games and what made it stick, and war games as well, since that's part, since that's um the other half of the equation. Yeah. Um, so, role-playing games came in a lot later, uh, but war games came in pretty early. My my best friend's stepdad was a huge Warhammer 40k gamer. Mm-hmm. Uh, that was back in the early, well, late 90s. And uh, we spent a lot of time around him, and he was teaching us to paint, taught us to play with the models, kind of, sort of taught us to play, but we ended up making up a lot of rules on our own um, because the, the, at that point we were too young to really interpret, I think it was second or third edition. The rules were just way above our reading comprehension at the time. You know, we were we were preteens, basically. And uh, so we spent a lot of time in my buddy's basement painting because stepdad had all the stuff and showed us how to use all the stuff and then playing just Mm -hmm. playing and trying to figure out what worked what felt fair what didn't work and we did that for years and years and years and i I was kind of always hooked on the the games workshop uh lore and aesthetic but we i i couldn't personally afford the models it wasn't until much later that that we were able to get into it and uh in college we did a lot of role-playing computer games but we didn't really have D D. So it wasn't until after college we had done land party after land party. I mean, it was it was an every week thing, guys coming in from out of town playing, and we just kind of hit this mutual nexus point after playing God only knows how many hours of Civ Five and Stellaris and different role playing together like the Divinity games, mm-hmm. um, and we we're just like it's kind of boring. Like we're doing the same thing over and over again. And I threw the idea out. Not knowing any better, but just thinking back to like, I like to play with the models, and I, and I collected models. My little brother paints almost professionally, um, and so I, I had this like little collection of models. And I was like, what if we do D and D? And collectively, no, nobody, none of us knew what that meant, you know. So they were like, cool. Why don't you learn the rules? And from that moment, I was basically the forever DM for our group. So I bought the, the, it was right after the starter set had come out. I guess we missed the 5e beta testing period. And uh, we bought the starter set. I learned the rules. We started playing, and it's been a bi-weekly, bi-monthly, bi-weekly, every other week or monthly thing for going on 10, 11 years now. Uh, Same group, pretty much. You know, a couple people came and went. We had a marriage and a divorce. We had some people split up and and move out of state. We had new family friends join, but it's the same core of people over the over almost ten years. Um, And and so from there, we've played we've played a myriad of different campaigns: some homebrew, some modules. We got into experimenting with increasingly homebrewed rules, which is where the inheritors rule set really comes out of. Uh, which isn't to say it's 5e at all. It's it's actually it's it's a complete reaction to 5e. And then we started playing. Got I finally was able to afford getting back into wargaming. Started playing Kill Team, Frostgrave, Stargrave, and we've experimented with a ton of different rule systems. You know, in the last like really four or five years, um, it's kind of become a proliferation. And and then we discovered that a bunch of guys where I work are into board games and making their own. So it it was kind of this like very slow funnel to the point where it became more enjoyable to play test and make our own things than to sit down and just play D and D. And you meant, you mentioned it being a, a response, which is apropos, I, su- I suppose, giv- given what happened back in January is that with the uh, the 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 open gaming license? Yeah. So yeah, yeah, they were they were pushing me. They're like, "You should release it now." And I was like, "It's not. It's undercooked. It's not ready." You know. Um, at that point, we were play testing regularly. So yeah, that whole fiasco that spooked some of the lifelong D and D players that kind of joined our circle. Um, 
and it it really spurred my friends to look at different rule systems in games. It sucks. It was a crappy moment. It it was, but the whole time I was actually laughing. <laughs> if I'm be if I'm being honest, because because um, I. I had kept, I had looked at and I didn't I did a post mortem video on my channel not too long ago about it. I looked into 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 the situation, and what I took what I took away from it was the fact that you had a bunch of people who had no idea what they were doing and had no idea what sort of what sort of um, Pandora's box they had opened. Yeah, and um. Especially, especially, especially the kind of precedent that could be set, could be set with open licenses. Mm -hmm. And <clears throat> I had in that in my postmortem, I had likened the I had likened the whole thing to um to when when Vince McMahon tried to jump tried to jump into football, but had no idea about football culture with yeah. the with that first iteration of the XFL. Yeah. Yeah. And not to be confused with the with the current one. That's that's run by people who actually have some idea of what they're doing. Yes. Uh, I'm talking that original one where they were trying to they were trying to mix pro wrestling and football, and it's and um in in a way that was like mixing oil and water. It it was wild to watch, but yeah, oil and water for sure. And try and trying to trying to have. Trying to trying to force trying to force storylines, the infamous "he hate me" thing, the fact that the ball what because it was smaller, it was easier to miss. Um, the the fa the fact that that um on the first play, what your one of these star QBs ended up getting a separated shoulder. Bad om bad omen there, if, if you ask me. Mm -hmm. But. Like just just not just not understanding the ecosystem that they had that they had stepped um, into, and still and still don't fully understand because they're still trying to push that um, that virtual tabletop using un using the Unreal Engine. Yeah. Which I had I had said I I believe that thing is going to that that is going to fail, especially since they want to put that on consoles, which I gear. I guarantee you, you would be hard, even if you can get Civilization on consoles. I guarantee you, anybody you know who's playing Civilization is playing it on PC. Right. Oh. Right. That's just yeah. It's it's a mode. It's a mode mismatch. I think that's indicative of a lot more in our society at the moment. And I think the problem is those people who are in charge of these things that we love, they don't play them. They don't think they get it. I don't think they ever got it. But it's it's got a it's got a, a face value to it, you know. And so there's a prestige in being in charge of this thing. But I mean, I've been a dork my entire life, and I and I own it, you know. I I, I spent my Saturdays after hockey practice going to comic book shops with my dad. We I, I grew up with Star Wars and Star Trek. I grew up with Warhammer, you know. So so this stuff is all like deeply intensely personal. And what I see and what I hear when they talk about this and when they put their foot in it like that, you know, it's like they pull a hand grenade and stick it in their mouth because they don't, they don't get it's not an apple. They, they don't get why it matters to people and when you mess with it in such a obvious way, I, I just don't, I don't think that they, I don't think that they're a part of it, which is very odd, but... Uh, it, on the yeah. other hand, I, the reason why I laugh is because I, is because I know that um, karma has a way of balancing the scales, and yeah, no joke. And if you if you want a recent example of that, well, um, they lost they lost their they lost their pub they lost their distribution agreement with Random House, which was how they were getting their stuff into a lot of store sh into a lot of store shelves. Yeah. That and Hasbro's stock has been graded as um, sell. Well, yeah, fair enough. I can feel it. So I'm gonna blow my, I'm gonna give my daughter a kiss real quick. She's going to bed. Sorry. North. Bye bye. Okay. Yeah, I mean, I and and of course it would be because they don't appreciate what they've got, and it shows. 
Mm-hmm. It shows in the way they talk. It shows in the products that they're releasing. And, and ultimately, it shows in consumer confidence and investor confidence. And there is none because it's phony. I don't, I don't think it was a coincidence. Crap. I don't think it was a coincidence that um, that they backed off the OGL thing a few days after they got called out by one of their investors. Um, yeah. Which, using the word, and the word that was used was unforced error. Um, <laughs> specific, specifically that they, as well as referring to the higher ups as leaderless. Their words, not mine. Interesting. Yeah, I, I haven't read that particular comment, but that's that that is what it feels like. And like like I said, the I'm I'm a firm believer in karma, and karma always finds finds a way to balance things out. But now, getting to inheritors, I th- I think the first thing to go into is is that you're using what you refer to as a unified D6 system. Now, yep. when you say unified. I'm assuming that this means that 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 this D6 system is all roads lead to Rome. I.e., any any type of check is going to be using some variation of this D6 system. Exactly. Yeah. So so I I, I neglected to say this earlier, but I've run the middle school D and D club at our at our middle school where I where I operate um, for years. And one of the biggest impediments for play for new players, whether they're adults that sit down to play with us or they're kids, is the polyhedrons they it's just this like impediment they get there eventually but it's a lot faster to just say grab the dice so when i started building games um and we started to break away from D, i just i was like it is easier it's easier everybody's got a d6 kicking around somewhere it's in their couch it's in their junk drawer it's in their bag everybody's got a d6 you can around. get a decent yeah. amount of them for a buck these days oh yeah yeah you absolutely can and and, and also working in education most teachers have dice somewhere in their in their room so if i need something i can grab it with these sixes so for me it's like this availability it's affordability it's economy for the players and a d6 has a 16 percent grade on the curve more or less that's not exact but basically it means that if i'm trying to balance something i can look at the probabilities a lot more carefully if i know what the probabilities are that players are coming into with it, and that that's led to more interesting combat scenarios because it's it feels less it is literally less random because I don't have random players wielding mm-hmm. random dice. Yeah, and as I understand it, it's in this case it's a um, d6 pool, um, fours and higher's are hits, is the yep. approach that you're taking. I and uh, I do have to make I do have to make that clear because. I've seen I've seen a lot of cases where somebody will say, "Oh, we're using a D6 system, or we're using a D10 system, or some or something like that," and I have to go. That tells me just enough to tell me nothing because right. I don't know if I don't know if it's aim high, I don't know if it's aim low, I don't know if it's a dice yeah. pool, if it's a single roll. But this this is an aim high dice pool, yeah. Mm-hmm. So and and again, like like a lot of our my favorite gaming experiences with my buddies have been in and around skirmish games, even if it's a skirmish game rolled into an R- into a role-playing campaign. So it's the tire higher rule, you know. So yeah. you're, you, you want, and I had to divide skill scores into two different categories here because if you always tell people lower scores are better, then it gets confusing with, with like hit points and stamina. So you've got skill scores and those you want lower. So a two plus, you have a significantly higher chance of rolling two or more than if it was a five plus, which is five or six. Mm-hmm. And then you've got your physical scores, and those determine you know the vitality stats. Yeah. Now with the action economy that you have, I I couldn't help but notice that it's built on um a a dot setup. Um, yeah. Was since you mentioned things being a response, was that to make things easier because some pe- some people were having issues with the with the idea of different categories of actions that's that a lot of games have um in part in part it's i think having dm'd a lot players tend to think in terms of move and attack and that's the full breadth of what they know how to do so by reducing that to you have two action points rather than you have your move and your attack. Um, I find my adolescent players and my newer players are more apt to consider the full breadth of options available to them, whether that's a move or a focus or a brace or an attack. 
You know, and there's a lot of actions and special actions that you could take. And a lot of that could simply be homebrewed in, like, oh, I want to do this with my turn. But I tried to provide a really wide buffet of actions for veteran and new gamers just to have a whole lot. Because it's, it's especially now when people are screen trained, if they don't see the option in front of them, they might not think of it. So I'm, I'm hoping that by providing this scaffold, it kind of activates the almonds and gets people thinking about what else they could do. And throughout the book, at every juncture that is, you know, linguistically appropriate, I remind the reader, you can invent new options. Like, that's totally okay. I, I want people to take this thing and run with it, which is why it comes with that open license at the tail end. I, I haven't put the full language up for it because I have to figure out exactly how it works for this one because it's a lot bigger than Feet First Into Hell. But basically... If you buy a book, I go ahead and, and use the rules to make your own new games. In perpetuity, forever, unto the heat death of the universe, you don't owe me anything. It would be cool if you credited it, but I'm not even going to require that, because ultimately, I'd rather people make stuff. Which is you know? definitely fair. Um, since, you, since you mentioned that whole creating your own actions, um, and I'm not, I'm not expecting hard and fast rules, but in the full book, do you plan on putting in something of a baseline for what an equivalent action would be as far as cost? Uh, I hadn't thought about it until you asked. So it's something I, I'm sure I could fit a paragraph in there. A lot of it is negotiating with your with your friends. Mm -hmm. You know, that is in there. Like, if you, if you have an idea, run it by your group and negotiate it out. That's that's baked into the game overview. And it, you're, you're told many times over, if you have a disagreement or if you have an idea, talk it out. And if you still can't agree, roll it out, right? Like in the 40K books, it's usually roll out to decide um but but a lot of times it's just that like negotiation so maybe a paragraph in there explaining like you know if it takes more than a second or something to do it so i'm sure i'm sure me and my buddies could hammer that language out yeah. which is some of the most fun that i've had writing these books is like sitting down and just hashing the language back and forth really quickly with my friends and i've obviously you obviously you can do the approach of of um just of just homebrewing it or using rule zero, but I've always I've always told people that it's best to have some sort of baseline, some sort of structure that they can build around instead of right. push, instead of throwing them into the middle of the pool and saying swim, damn it. Right. Yeah, that makes sense. I, I have a I have similar rules like that for developing additional powers and for upgrading and building better weapons. So it would be it would be concomitant with that idea. Mm-hmm. Now, one of the big things that's that's brought up on the Kickstarter regarding the game's mechanics, and you even did a, a full mini video on it, is the hit trade system. Yep. And I'd like to know what prompt what prompted this particular concept, and how do you have it work within the sandbox of Inheritors? The whole game is built around this concept. So. I, as the forever DM, I, I say that, but I actually haven't been the DM for about two years now. Once, when my daughter was, when my wife was pregnant with my daughter, I basically had like a, a talk with the group and I said, once she's born, I'm not going to have the cognitive wherewithal to DM anymore. So one of the guys took over who's, who's done some spot DMing before. So for about two years, I've been free of the, of the, the golden throne but uh one of the things that i've run into with adult players and sometimes our group is huge sometimes it's as big as eight people and sometimes it's with my middle schoolers and i've damned groups of in excess of 10 players is the rounds take forever even when people know what they're doing because it's the D, &D model is bad teaching mm -hmm. in my professional capacity one of the things that I do is I work with teachers and I, I try to get them to look at how they could do things more effectively, um, particularly in, in the mode of, of getting kids to read more effectively. So how do we take what we're seeing and then use that to inform our instruction as reading teachers to improve uh, what kids are, you know, what kids are doing and then what they're capable of and then getting them to do that independently. And when I look at the D&D &D model, I see archaic, bad pedagogy. It's DM centered, nobody has any agency while something else is being resolved, and what it leads to is basically a queue. You're stuck in line waiting for your turn. And my group are great people, but we're also adults with full time jobs. We drink when we play D D. 
it is really easy to lose the thread of what is happening when the DM is forced to narrate and then somebody gets analysis paralysis. You know, an, an adult has a working memory that can last for several minutes with decaying, uh, decaying resolution very quickly. So if you're dealing with something abstract, even with minis on the board, and you have to wait <clears throat> 5, 10, 15, 20 minutes for your turn, when it gets around to you, assuming that what you were going to do at that point was relevant to begin with, you may have lost the full purpose. And I just don't like that experience. It's nothing to do with my DM. My DM's fantastic. The the guy that runs our group right now, he, he puts his, ba- his whole back into it. But with D&D, you're locked into that Dungeon Master system unless you want to homebrew it. So with Inheritors, what we did is and we spent months going over this t- trialing and pushing back and forth, back and forth, is we looked at how do we speed rounds up? And the first thing we realized is we all know how combat works. Why don't we run the monsters and the DM can supervise? But that it didn't really work right. Mm-hmm. And we, we narrowed that system down to two roles, active player and then the, the, the opposing role player. And the opposing role player is doing the thing with the monsters. So they are your temporary competition. They activate so that they have something to do while you run with your character. And then you flop rolls. So everybody gets to activate with the hit trade system. And then within that, the whole reason that that works is because of the active defense system. When you attack as the active player playing your hero, Somebody needs to do something for the monster because Inheritors has an active defense system. Those monsters need to make decisions about how they're going to, to, if they're going to react, if they're able to react, how they're going to react, and how they might apply their defensive dice. So it really, it really engages all the players. One DM can do the whole thing. It's still faster than D&D. We experimented with it like that. But it's much faster if you have one person who is kind of in charge of like narrating the story, which I have some adventure modules that do that. Or if you just have people working within the skirmish environment, if the narrative is not important and you're collaborating kind of in like mini scenes, mini duels and everybody plays until all the characters are, are done uh, and they've activated. So that hit trade system, like the whole game is built around that. Yeah. Given what you, given what you said, would it be fair of me to say that, because of how you have this hit trade system that that a large amount of roles are contested roles instead of roles against a static um, modifier? Um, every role is compared to your own stats, and that's a thematic decision. But mm-hmm. whether or not that role is successful and then does something is contested. All right. So, for example, like, I, like the, the base assumption is that I know how to use my sword well enough that if I roll and hit my stat, I will be able to deal damage to you. I'm not an idiot who's swinging my sword in an overhand arc knowing that you have your shield up, right? Mm -hmm. I'm an adventuring hero. I would do a side swing or a mordhau or a buffalo strike or something. I'd know how to use that sword more effectively. So your, your armor has a role to play, but based on the weapon that you're wielding would logically change that so the system is simulating around that so if you hit your proficiency mark uh your your, it's your pro score then you can choose whether you want to apply that as either a strike which deals damage or a block which can block incoming damage and the dice for attacker and defender are rolled simultaneously then the attacker takes initiative and they say okay i have this many successes this one's going to be a strike and the defender decides what to do and you play back and forth until you're out of successes Mm-hmm. So with now, with that in mind, I, bl- I believe you had described Inheritors as equal parts um, skirmish war game and and role playing game, which does does lead me to a- does lead me to ask a few things because because of the particular quirks within but within both of those. So even in skirmish war games. There is there is usually still some form of point system when it comes to but when it comes to building armies, whereas you have the more personal um, character building approach in a role playing game. Mm-hmm. Um, 
when it comes to those two ends of the equation, how how do you bal how do you balance that out, or is it a case of one um, getting dropped over the other? That's a good question. So a lot of the math in balancing out the point systems is done was done in the background over the last two years, trying to figure out how powerful can these heroes be against an enemy set. So so the the way that the it functions in two different ways. There's there are two different modes of play. There's uh, the competitive sk skirmishes, and then there's the cooperative. Uh, exploration missions or expeditions is what they're called. So within the skirmish mode, you, we've we've played a lot with the math to balance out heroes at different levels. And if you've played Frostgrave, you'll be familiar with main character and follower set setup. Mm -hmm. And so you're spending your gold, which are your points, to build a team based on okay, here's my inheritor. That's your that's your gimme. That's your given. How high do you want to level that character up? And then how many heroes of different levels do you want to hire and those are tiered out as gold and that's the background math that we did to figure out okay like roughly how many points would these be just converted into a fun currency a generic fun currency within the cooperative mode it's more about the role playing experience and what we did is we ran a lot of play tests with enemies at different levels of difficulty to figure out okay at level 1 this is a good type of enemy and sufficient number to pose a threat to heroes at level one. And as you're leveling up, the enemies, you're also more likely to encounter more challenging enemies, but also their number decreases because those missions know, okay, these are, these are more expensive and more challenging units. But there's also that thematic element within role-playing. So we looked at a bunch of different mission types from different games, be it video games or uh, board games or role-playing games, and we identified like genres of adventure, and then I built out eight, I think it's eight, cooperative missions that have those enemy waves or reinforcements or initial deployments pre-designated for an inheritor team consisting of two to four inheritors and four to eight followers um, based on the enemy math. So that you so you can basically plug and play that. There's a narrative component as well that I'm writing in the background. Um, it, it's intended to be the first stretch goal in the Kickstarter, but if we're being honest, I'm probably going to get itchy and just stick it in the book anyway because it's mostly done and why not? Um, and that one, I've... That one it's more role playing less skirmish although there are definitely some skirmish missions where it's like here's a death match or here's an objective based match but i'm i'm not as concerned about balance within the narrative because it's harder to control for the number of player options going into like a long form narrative role playing game mhm mm yeah i can i can certainly get that and within Within um character within character um creation, um, obvious, obviously the obviously when it comes you have the um you have the whole thing with the inheritors and the followers as as mentioned before. Mm -hmm. Um, what I am curious of, what I am curious about is the is um with it is. If I'm not mistaken, the equivalent to cla the equivalent to classes are in the form of the rings, the gr the yes. great rings in in the material sent. Yep. Now, given that given that, um, what's what's kind of the structure on how on how it works? Is it is it going to be um, level based or is it going to be set a more archetype based approach? Uh, you're gonna have to clarify for me when you say archetype or level based. Which which part are you talking about? So level based means um, at each at each threshold, whether it be level, rank, what have you, um, you're always getting a certain thing out of it. Um, archetype based is where you have a certain list of things you can pick and choose from within a given umbrella, in in a sense. Uh, okay, so every Every other level, you're getting a you get a choice of a stat boost, and then on the odd levels, you get to choose a new power along with a stat boost. and And really, we went with player customization over 
um, the linear track that's available in, in other role-playing games. So you have a, a bevy of powers to choose from. And as long as you meet the minimum stat thresholds for those powers, uh, then you can take that power when you have the option to choose a new ability. And there's also general skills. So if you look at it and you're like, ah, eh, I can't do the one I want right now, but I can get this other one that will help the party, you can grab a general skill as well. And those those are more role-playing focused skills generally. Mm -hmm. So I think it's kind of a, a, a little bit of both. Yeah. So with that in mind, I'd, I'd like to go through the list of the of the great rings presented to me. Yeah. And just get just get a feel for their particular kit, what they're going to be bringing to the table. Um, starting with the bear. So before we even get into the bear, um, the idea behind the great ring is not that it's a, the job that you inherited or that you stumbled into. You have in some way that that could be it could be customized it could be rolled randomly on it could be something that you sat there and, and wrote out your character has come into an artifact of cosmic semi-divine significance mm -hmm. that's what distinguishes an inheritor from basically any other mainline mortal and that is it's it, it sounds like a chosen one trope but it's it's not it's a mend it's a melding of fate and free will because when you put that ring on you are indelibly changed but you're also beginning to act on the ring so the closest comparison that i can think of is something like avatar the last airbender but in avatar ang is being he's he's coached and talked to periodically by the other avatars but he's not pushing back on them as well so that ring, it imbues the, the combined experience of the other inheritors, which is represented in the powers that you have a choice to choose from. Those are manifestations of previous inheritors' powers. But also, as your character develops, the idea is you would be pushing back against those as well. And hopefully, if you get invested into the game, you would add a power that would become one of the homebrewed powers available to future inheritors uh, that might that might wield that ring within your own party because it should be this kind of living document. That's what this thing is. So, so to jump into the inheritors, each one of them is really, it's an archetype that I pulled out of the great cultural epics. I spent a couple of years just like really reading really e epic poetry and the cultural epics. I, I went on a kick about it a couple of years ago and I was just fascinated with how we kept seeing the same face more or less with a different name show up again and again and again all over the place. So I, I kind of, this sounds hoity-toity, but it's not. I kind of synthesized out what are the seven types of heroes that I keep seeing. And I'm sure if you went and you looked at Jung, or if you went and looked at, like, uh, what is it, King, King, Lover, Wizard, something, whatever, you know. Th I, those are, I don't have enough alcohol to go down that rabbit hole again. That's Yeah, that's fine. It's, it's, it's archetypical stuff, right? Mm -hmm. So the, the bear represents rage. And that sounds like a berserker, but it's not. It's somebody who is bristling with energy, with power, and the focus of that is is some sort of violence. Whether it's constructive or productive or destructive is up to you. But the Ring of the Bear is all about that kind of like feral hunger mm -hmm. that drives somebody on. Yep. So um, the type of the type of powers that 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 character would manifest are going to be physical, obviously, but it can spread, right? Mm -hmm. Because you're dealing with, with what is essentially a leader character. All of the inheritors are leaders. So you have your berserk style power, um, but, but you can build on that. You can synergize with that, whether you want that berserk to stack onto that particular archetype, or if you want to spread it around your party and turn everybody blood mad, you have some options for synergy within the bear. Um, so it's kind of your damage tank, and it's your it's your it's your big damage dealer. It's your monster slayer. Mm -hmm. And uh, it's I will I will admit using kit is is my catch all. It's not meant to imply classes or or limited power lists or something like that. It's more of a the, a um, theme. Mm -hmm. um, but moving pa moving past that, the next one would be the bull. 
So the the bull is stubbornness. It's that it's that person who will not leave the city when it's under siege because they have that divine mandate to protect their home, their place, or the people who are stuck there. So you might look at that as a paladin, but it could also be the stubborn king who won't give up on his people. It could be the the figure that's decided that they're messianic. It's it's that idea of like divine retribution that does not waver. So the ring of the bull characters, they are. Uh, they they're stubborn, they're combat oriented, and they are usually the tip of the spear. So they're the, they're the ones that are right there on the front lines, and they will not retreat until their party's safe. So they have some party support capabilities as well, but a lot of it is like getting in the enemy's face, turning back swarms and 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 uh, and hordes of enemies, and providing buffs that weaken the enemies rather than supporting the party more generally. Mm-hmm. So next would be the hawk. The hawk is my wife's character, so I have to be. I have to make sure I, I talk about it clearly. The, <laughs> this, all, all of these, at some point, were actually characters that we were playing, like in in our own uh, homebrew campaign that went on for a couple years. So the classes were kind of synthesized out of my my players proclivities i gave them some ideas to take with so but the ring of the hawk was was ultimately my wife's um so this one is it's the tempest it's the character who comes in swinging they're they're rippling with power it's a it's a sorceress class um but it's really it's energetic it's momentum and movement it's the hurricane made flesh mm-hmm. so the, a lot of spell casting powers a lot of maneuverability which in a skirmish game or role playing game, maneuverability is in a skirmish game maneuverability is key, right? Yeah. Role playing game it can sometimes get ignored. In this case, this is a character who's jetting around. They've got really long range pinpoint attacks, and they can make for a great backup character. But also, they can do some pretty interesting solo stuff because they can reach out and touch you with those lighting powers, and they can escape really fast. Yeah. Oh, um, and when when you mention when you mention um. A whole lot of a whole lot of move, whole lot of movement and ca- and casting. Um, what immediately came to mind is is um, a disbelief in the concept of friendly fire. Yeah. And again, I've always argued that friendly fire is an ox- is an o- is both an oxymoron and more income and more accurate than incoming enemy fire. Yes, it does stop being friendly the moment you pull the trigger and hit the wrong person. Oh. Uh, at the at the same time, um, the the there's a list of, there's a short list of things that I have up my, on my wall called the rules of combat they don't teach you, uh, which include which include things like tracer rounds work both ways, if the enemy's in range <laughs> so are you, if you're short right. on everything except enemy you're in combat, yeah, radios will fail as soon as you need fire support, um, never share a foxhole with anyone braver than you. And um, if you can't remember, the claymore is pointed toward you. Because I like I'm, that one ends on a silence. Because that's <laughs> clever. Well, that's I, good. I, I was about to say I don't have any proof of it, but I'm, but I would I would I will swear up and down that I'm I'm pretty sure the the um, claymore has has front toward enemy written on it because of some unfortunate accidents. Yeah. Yeah, that or very low confidence on the designer's part. I think a little of both because I've been I've I've been around I've been around plenty of people who who have served. Everybody I know who's done any form of service has a the military is stupid story. In one form or another, they have it. Of just yeah. of if they if they had spent any time in Fort Polk, they have two minimum. Because nobody oh, I know wrong. has. Nobody I know has anything nice to say about Fort Polk. Yeah, I don't know that one. I know I, we, we've got a couple bases around us, and, and I'm from a service family. I didn't serve myself. I'm from a service Fort, family. I've heard many of them. Fort Polk is in Louisiana, deep okay. in, deep in, in muggy-ass swamp country. It sounds like an interesting place. Um, appar- apparently, it's a, apparently, it's a case where... The only re- the only reason the government has that land is because no one else wants it. Yikes! 
understandable because it's because it's it's swampland territory, and well one well one of my acquaintances had a interesting story of of being forced to wear berets properly, and he and to this day he absolutely despises berets. Because imagine yeah, wearing, I've heard imagine, similar things. Imagine wearing that when it's hot when it's hot and when it's in the middle of summer, it's hot and muggy as hell because you're in a damn swamp. It's an interesting way to be forced to show loyalty, that's for sure. <sighs> but he do that but it inspired one of the other rules. No combat ready unit has ever passed inspection, and no inspection ready unit has ever passed combat. <laughs> yeah. But now that one I get working working in schools. That one I get. Mm -hmm. Um, but the next on the list is the is the lion. Yeah, this one occupies the unique uh, niche in that it's received the most back fictional development. It's it's actually out of the characters that this class is composed of that this whole thing ultimately unfolded. So the ring of the lion has a kind of special place in my heart. You might notice it in the like the. The company name yeah but this is the, the ring of the lion is about ambition so this is the kingly class it is the the uh the one who rises class so it, it can be contrasted to the bull which is about stubbornness and it can be contrasted to the bear which is about fury and while this has those aspects the ring of the lion is really about that the the, the king has stepped up mentality right so uh if if you're into fiction, I explore one of these inheritors uh, kind of at a piv pivotal point in the in the whole uh, game's lore through my short story collection, The Trials of the Lion. Um, but what this what this class is really about is battlefield dominance and prowess. So you have to play this class aggressively. Mm -hmm. But when you're doing that, you're locking down the field in order to support your buddies. So where the bull is driving enemies before them with that righteous fury, right? The lion is locking down the enemies in front of them so that their followers or their squad mates can get right in there and start cutting them to pieces. So it's another it's another battle line uh, uh, archetype, but it's really about constantly being ambitious and pushing as hard as you can to accomplish your objectives. Mm -hmm. It's it's the one that I tend to play the most. It shows up in the it shows up in the tutorial simply because it's the one that I know the best. Um, but it, it's also the one that's received the most narrative development. Mm -hmm. So the next one would be the owl. Yeah, this is the closest thing that I have to a straight-up wizard, although it's it's a little bit more like Merlin. It's a little bit more un unpredictable. Mm -hmm. So the Ring of the Owl class is all about mastering the arcane elements of the battlefield, and spellcasting is not a background feature. It is it's almost constant at the at the middle and higher levels of play because you've got so many sorceress enemies. So having the number of options available to the owl to disrupt enemy spellcasting to completely alter the battlefield to lock down and like specific high value enemies are, are what this particular magic class is good at it has the fireball and it's got the earthquake but it's also got a bunch of other powers that allow you to manipulate your own vitality statuses to change the battlefield to really like perform those high level feats of magic that you expect at the end of a of a major combat scene you know this is the guy who pulls in clutch with the spell you didn't know he knew mm-hmm um, I suppose I suppose in the, I suppose in that regard I could throw I could throw Gandalf into the mix just as much as Merlin but it's to it's um it's a case of ch it's that's a chicken and egg situation um, right but next would be the salamander yeah, uh, this this one I I like I love this class, but I I bounce with that name. I ultimately went with, went with Salamander for some for some mythic reasons. But this you could shorthand it and say this is your your healer, but this is your prophet class. Mm -hmm. It's really a prophet, and it's actually modeled on Moses more than like the typical cleric. So this is about performing feats and wonders. Uh, some of those are healing based, but a lot of those are demonstrating presence right there on the battlefield so whether you're helping somebody to recover or you're creating a pillar of fire or you're condemning the bad enemies 
I, I had a lot of fun like researching what were ancient prophets like, you know, and and kind of wrapping that into the idea of you'd need a healer on the battlefield, but that person is not really a sawbones. This is like I like I, I've glimpsed the divine reality and I can manifest it in front of me. But sometimes that's ugly. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and the it's it's funny you it's funny you bring bring up that whole thing of this being more of a prophet than the than the typical he, the typical healer because it does reflect on something I've been seeing a lot more and more people do with cl with class design, but I'll get to that in a minute. Um, yeah. The last of them is the stag, which is an interesting choice beca because of the implications the stag has, has had in a lot of mythologies, being this <laughs> omen for quests, just to name one instance. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and, and also being an, an ancestral wilderness guardian, you know, in some cases a divine manifestation in and of itself to see the white stag or the golden stag. Mm-hmm. You know, and that ties into a lot of the quest literature. So the stag is it's it's a warden class, but it's not it's not a tank. It's somebody who's got additional additional companions on top of their followers, and their job is to make the wall that the enemy shouldn't pass. So they're ranged. They're going to be raining arrows. They're going to be using one of one of their minions or both of their minions to perform additional, you know, enemy locking down. So it's it's a little bit of a ranger, it's a little bit of a druid, and it's a little bit of a of a warden is, is really the best that I can get to it. It's 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 your ranged uh area of control tactic. Mm -hmm. And I'd say, I'd say in that regard it's what it's what a ranger is supposed is supposed to have been instead of what a ranger ends up being. Yeah, in the middle school club, the kids are always disappointed by the ranger. Um, the the funny th the thing that I've stated about the rain about the ranger class in the past is that while a lot of people are disappointed in the f and and it's got it's gotten a bum rap because it's been reworked three times in the mm. last eight years. Um, this is not a new problem. The ranger no. has 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 had problems going all the way back to AD and D, um, right? And I I don't have any proof of this, but I speculate that the ranger down running joke that was around for a while is the reason why the at death's door rules were implemented in future editions. I don't have any proof of that; it's just my own suspicion. But if the, but if I did get confirmation, I would just nod and say, "Yeah, that tracks." But yeah. The two, the two things that, I, one, the two things that have always held that class back is, for one, not having a particular footprint that they can that they can put their stamp on, right. um, aside from very situational affairs or, uh, or stuff that is built around out built around outdoorsiness in a game called Dungeons and Dragons. Yep. Yep. <laughs> this is this is also why the Cavalier didn't last. Yep. Because I don't know about you, but it's kind of hard to bring a horse that deep underground. Mm -hmm. But the the other problem is is that so much of what it already does is done better by is done better by other classes. And right when some when somebody asks me, okay, okay, how would you tackle it? I'd say, okay, first off, stop thinking that the ranger is supposed to be Aragorn or Legolas. That's that's their that's their pattern, right? The ring, but that's just a sneaky fighter <laughs> if you if you really if you really want to if if you're the template that you should be using instead of those two is john rambo yes yeah i, I heard you say that in another show I, i've listened to a couple of the episodes at this point and i think you're 100 percent on yeah and and I, I if i could add to it beowulf i think beowulf would be a good uh a good i'd say beowulf if i have to use something more contemporary um Geralt of Rivia. Yeah, yes, that's what I was thinking because Beowulf shows up to kill monsters. So yeah, Geralt would be uh, there. Geralt would be a good contemporary one for those that aren't familiar and with Beowulf. To that end, I will always argue that things like favored terrain and favored enemy um, are the in, are the inverse of what they're supposed to be. Yes. Yeah. Because, yeah. Because 
read those, they're like, wait. And I'm like, yeah, we're going to homebrew that a little bit. Um, one of my good, one of my good friends, brother Tanner, who in his game, heavens and heresies took the approach uh, when it came to favorite enemy of, okay. Okay. If, if you're, when you're doing your, when you're doing your targeting stuff, if it's, if it's this type of enemy, you get this type of bonus. Um, and ha having a short list of, I think like, I think like six different enemy types with, with, um, different bonuses for each. Mm hmm and it isn't a case where you pick one and that's and that's and that's your favorite enemy. No, you get you you have you potentially have them automatically. It's just which ones are you um are yeah. you which ones are applicable. And same go same goes with terrain and even and even more so with the fact that he implemented a trophy system, which is something I was thinking of doing anyways. Yes. Yeah, that's actually so in in the middle school club, we kids are always gravitate towards the ranger because they they know who Paragorn is. Um, although less so now than a couple years ago, unfortunately. But the, with the the favorite enemy, what I do is, is I give them bonuses if they're role playing and asking questions. So basically, they're researching the monsters as they're fighting or as they're role playing. And when they do that, they reach a threshold. I grant them a bonus for fighting that category of enemy. And then they, they they're middle schoolers, so of course they take trophies. They want to cut everything's head off and wear it, you know. But, but we do that additional thing, and then they can use that to either turn it in, or they can use it as an intimidation thing. So I, I've woven the idea of the Beowulf or the Monster Hunter into our homebrewed middle school ranger class, because otherwise they really do kind of get the short end of the stick in both ways. Well, of course, the big problem, the big problem is that the druid exists. Not in my middle school club, it don't. <laughs> well, it's too complicated for the kids. Same thing I, with the monk and the bard. You get thrown right out the window. I can I can see I can see that the the reason why I say that is um and is is actually more emblematic of the problem that the that classes like the druid have of just being able to be an entire party all by themselves. Yeah. Um, I remember in I remember back in the back in the day we we would use the term Codzilla. Um the cod meaning cleric or druid. Because somebody who knew what they were doing with either of them, or in some cases oh, yeah. both, um, was an entire party by themselves. I mean, look at the cleric. You oh, can yeah, wear yeah, metal yeah. armor. You can you can we you can wield you can wield melee weapons close to the same close to the same um, tier as a fighter. You just can't use cutting weapons for some reason. Um, you're able you're able to you're able to turn undead. You're able to heal. You're able to cast. Mm -hmm. You. Mm -hmm. Um, the only the only thing you don't have are are are, th are thief skills. Other than that, you're an entire party by yourself. Right. And druid, you can do all you can do all of that. Plus, you can shape shift, and in and some shape shift forms. Well, you end up you end up doing more damage than the fighter, whose whole gimmick is supposed to be able to do a lot of damage up close. Yep. Yep. Uh, that's kind of what I mean when I when I say entire parties by themselves. Oh no, I totally follow. And the and the people who adhere to those classes act like there's nothing wrong with that or cry poor when you get when you give the martial characters things to do. Yeah. Oh. Uh, but now given now given the requ given the requirements that that's mentioned um would it be fair of me to say that the requirements are are fairly are fairly light? This isn't going to be a case where, um, where you have something like the feet problem in third edition, where you were, um, or you were doing false choice just to get a particular thing because of all the prerequisites. Looking at you, no, and attack. No, that the the feet system. While while I appreciate it as somebody who perpetually plays human characters. Uh, in, in the case of inheritors, most of it is attainable within a level or two to open up those options. The really powerful ones that require more than three or four levels to grab, or they might have two prerequisite stats, those are the really synergistic attacks or or powers that build on one another. So I, what I did is I is through a lot of play testing, we pushed those powers down in terms of or we i guess we elevated them and how hard it was to unlock that that option so that you would have to do the first step logically 
rather than just setting it as being like, uh, you know, here's just a thing dangled way out there. It's like logically, oh, you want to get there, you're going to have to go down this other path, which opens up the, the initial power to you. Mm -hmm. So nothing is intended to be gated. But what we did do is we actually mapped out, we, we came up with more than 20 powers for each of these seven classes. And there are other ones, but but they don't fit thematically with what's going on in the in the central city of Amidia. So there are other great rings. There's 12 in total. But a couple of them are lost to time. A couple of them are elsewhere. And, you know, if we get there with expansions, we get there with expansions. But with these seven, we mapped out more than 20 powers. And then we looked at, okay, what's thematically, what's this class doing from the initial priority? What's Or, or the verbs, because we when we when we're working together we're designing games around core verbs that we want the players to do mm -hmm. so those verbs become priorities and then we figured out what are what are the primary aggressive powers that people might choose if they want to be attacky what are the clever powers that require a little finagling but can but can end up having subtle and profound effects what are the support powers and there's a mixture of all of those available to each class but what support looks like to one ring is very different than from another one. So, for example, I, I mentioned the, the bull and the lion. Support for the lion might be emboldening your crew. It might be locking down and stunning the enemies nearby. For the bull, it might be driving away the light avoidant enemies so that your your guys can get in there, whether to attack with some advantage or to just get in where otherwise they would be too hard-pressed. So we have these categories of powers within this chart, which is it's alphabetized for simplicity, of support, attack, and then the, the, the subtle or more clever powers. So I, what I don't want to do is I don't ever want to lock somebody out of building the character that they want to build. You know, I, I, I don't like the false choice designs. If I'm going to be investing in my character for the next year or two years or three years... I don't want to be constantly second-guessing myself, like, oh, what if I had spent this point here? I'd rather just open that menu up quickly but gradually and let people pick to build the hero that they want to play. Yeah. Now, within the war gear, I, I noticed that there's, a fa that there's a fair few notes, but there's... And while, it, and while I didn't... Ha while I wasn't able to see any explanation for, for him in that chapter, there's... Most of them I can reasonably fi figure out. There are a f there are a few where I'm curious how you're how you're going to have them work. The big one is um, stout defense. Yes, yeah. <laughs> it's a it's a reference to uh, the Wheel of Time. So the whole list of all of the weapon effects are on page fifty six, and this isn't Midra's uh, Mildred's fault. I didn't send the PDF to him until right before the thing started, so. There's no reason okay, he would now. know the page. But there yeah. is a full list of everything for, for players. Mm -hmm. So the stout defense ties into the active defense system. So, you know, I was thinking of Little John when we came up with that. You know, Little John sitting in the forest. He's got that big, thick bar that he's mm -hmm. fighting with, that huge quarterstaff. And so just having that extra reinforced haft allows you to be more defensive. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I... Now that I scrolled down a bit, I did I did see it. It's that's that's partially on me. I ha I have the habit of um see of having the say the keywords or tags or what have you for weapons within this within the same page relative page range of the um weapon list itself. Yeah. Um, now that you say that aloud, I think I should move that page. I think that's a good observation. Oh. Um, that be, that being said, that being said, I will always appreciate an, any game that um, that um respects the respects the value of of things like war scythes or whips. Yep. Uh. Well, this is another reaction to Five E. Is and and I've played Five E for ten years. I I know it like the back of my hand. I have introduced literally hundreds of kids to D and D with Five E. So this is not. The, the inheritors is not a criticism of it. It's 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 a growing beyond it. You know, it's me flopping out of the nest and finding my wings. Mm -hmm. So one of the things that my players constantly complain about is that their weapons in D and D are effectively just different dice, and they really wanted something more tactical. Now, if I try to get them to play kill team with me, half of them won't show up. 
you know, where so yeah, that's sometimes too far the other that's too far the other end of the of it's, the um, pendulum. Right. And but then, you know, there's a couple other guys that like we, we play war games together and, and so we get into the list building, you know, and like we're really looking at what's okay, what's the difference between the bolt gun, the bolt pistol and the bolt rifle? There's no difference. All the bolt guns are the same and it drives me nuts. But anyway, um within within this we played with okay what do you think this weapon would really do how would it change combat and i only have a couple stats running because the goal is to keep it light and fast but how realistically within you know that snapshot of you attacking how many times could you hit them with it well that's your attack stat twice two dice would it realistically do armor piercing would it punch through plate or would it punch through leather or chain that's what that ap stat is and then if you were to whack somebody with it and hit them how devastating would the damage really be that's your damage stat and then how far can it realistically reach so we really played with how do we differentiate a staff or a pylum or a spear from a whip from a throwing knife from a blunderbuss and the system that we have it's not perfect but it's it makes you th- I think it encourages the players to think more deeply about the equipment that they're bringing, whether that's in a skirmish where, okay, I know I'm going up against a Ring of the Lion, so he's going to have lockdown powers. I have to have range to stay away from him. Or in a competitive or a cooperative thing, I'm thinking, I'm going on a raid mission. We're going to be dealing with lots of enemies. I need to prioritize lots of attack, basically. Mm-hmm. Um, or a big monster hunting thing where I know I'm going up against a boss armor piercing is going to be really important for that. So I I think the spread that we developed allows p- role players to think in some dimensions like a war gamer, really thinking about the list that they're building for what they're bringing into that particular action scene, which is your your skirmish game. Yeah. And um I will no- I will note a sim- a similar appreciation uh, of just having um, gunpowder weaponry because so many. This is a this is a pet peeve of mine that I've that I've had for about twenty or so years. So with so many um games that want that want to do medieval fantasy, but act but mm-hmm. we're supposed to magically act like gunpowder doesn't exist, even though in the times that the that a lot of games are trying to emulate, or or the style of medieval that that they're trying to emulate, gunpowder was a thing. Mm-hmm. And yet we're supposed to act like that it wasn't, right? Even more right, yeah. so with um, games that like to do this whole, oh, you can use this to run all kinds of fantasy. Yeah, well, what if I want to run steampunk? Where's my guns? Right. Well, I've got them for you. If you want to use the, the inheritor's rule to publish a steampunk game, you have the rules. You know, these are these are archetypical weapons. You could make modifications of them, and you you, you have the open game license. You're free to publish it. It was whatever you want, as long as you don't call it inheritors, because that's my thing. You can use all the mechanics in this book. So well, I, I was gonna call it inheritance, but that, but I'd get sued by somebody else. <laughs> Probably, yeah. I, I, when the Kickstarter went live, somebody was poking at me saying there was another game with the title. But at that point, it's, it, it's not similar enough that it's an issue. But yeah, it is coming up with titles well, hard. Yeah, I'm not, I wouldn't, I wouldn't call it that. I, that was just me being a smartass. But no, that's um, fine. I mean, you could. I, I, I wouldn't come after you. I like. I. I've. Whenever I've designed weapons, I've all, I, for my players, I've always had this policy of giving my players very powerful but very unsafe weaponry. Um, one of the key, one of the um, key ones is something I've called the Sonic Crossbow or the Banshee Crossbow or whatever I want to call it that time around. That is, for all intents and purposes, a fantasy version of the Noisy Cricket for Men in Black. I can appreciate that. <laughs> you know. Does a hell of a lot of damage, but every time you fire the thing, you're gonna get knocked. 20, you're gonna get knocked twenty feet. I can appreciate that. That's that's closer to how spellcasting works in inheritors. There's you always run the risk of not connecting with the spell, and you burn mm-hmm. stamina. But sometimes it really backfires. Like the really potent spells, occasionally they will blow up in your face yeah. if you fail. So the thought process is, if I'm playing like a Merlin character, or a Moses character, you know. The odds of me blowing up my incantation are pretty low, but if they do, they're disastrous. Um, I rem- the I'm a big fan of Thirteenth Age, and in the description of the sorcerer for Thirteenth Age, it it made one. There was one note in the description that stuck with me in ter- in terms of designing this sort of thing. That sorcerers don't necessarily cast a spell as much as they uncork it. 
That is a very good analogy, yeah. And it put what it put in my mind is is say um the is is you've you probably had the case where you don't know if you don't know if after dropping say a can of diet coke or something if it if it's been su- suitably shaken or just opening a bottle of of soda slowly so that it doesn't explode. And of course, of course, some people don't know how to be careful with that, and it's st- and it still does. And I remember the vending machine in one of my places had a sticker on the bottom that says, "Open bottles slowly." And inevitably, somebody didn't listen, opened the bottle quickly, and then was surprised when they got sprayed. That's the Claymore thing again. <laughs> yeah. I, I, I like that kind of magic. There, there's definitely a time and a place for the subtle slow magic, and that's more of like the salamander. Mm-hmm. But I, I'm a huge fan of the unpredictable... Um, the unpredictable mountain-moving magic. I feel I feel that when a when a mage is casting spells, it should not it in in the in the traditional sense. It it should not be it should not be something where nobody knows it. It should be everybody in earshot knows that this is happening. Yeah, you you, know? you you see the glowing runes or the fire braiding itself together over their head. Mm-hmm. That's that's kind of the idea behind the hit trade systems. Like you're not standing there getting hit. You're swinging a sword at your head, or they're raising their hands to cast a spell at you, and it gives you the inheritor's hit trade system gives players or enemies the opportunity to respond to what's happening around them when they're the target of it. Mm-hmm. So, I mean, I 100% agree with you. It should be dramatic. You know, you're warping reality to your will, whether it's the warp itself or whether it's the the the, the source from Wheel of Time or whatever the hell it is that Gandalf draws on, the other characters that are savvy would see it. They'd see the signs and wonders. Yeah. Oh. I'm a bit... I've... I've been reading through the Stormlight Archive off and, off and on, and there's there's definitely no subtlety with, with some forms of the, of the magic in that. Yeah, definitely with, not. And put, putting aside the fact that I want whatever drugs um, Sanderson is on with how much he... With how much he puts out. <laughs> oh man, I can't even imagine. Like, I stared at screen enough vac- for work. He was supposed to be on vacation a while back, and he ended up he ended up writing a bunch of. St- he ended up writing a, um, a, cu- a couple a couple sh- a few short stories and a novella, while he was supposed I, to be on vacation. I got to tell you, as somebody who gets possessed by ideas periodically, I cannot imagine the interior quality of my life if I was seized by them 24-7 like he and, and maybe Stephen King seem to be. Mm-hmm. I That's got to be... It looks great looking in. You'd be like, you know, I, yeah, I want to have that kind of... But, man, to be constantly distracted by yourself and to be seething like that, that's got to be exhausting. Maybe that maybe that's why Stephen King did so much cocaine. Yeah, he's got to bang the words out faster. <laughs> Imagine doing so much cocaine you forgot writing bestsellers. That's wild to me. Well, he forgot he forgot everything that happened with Maximum Overdrive, <laughs> which is 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 certainly the complete opposite of a be, of a bestseller. But yes, I I remember you. I remember using using the using that joke when I was running the Strange. Where I, where I said a few decades ago, Stephen King did half of the world's cocaine, but there are worlds beyond our own. <laughs> Oh, <laughs> that's wild! It's wild. I, I didn't. I didn't know about Sanderson writing so much on vacation. Yeah, that ha- that happened. Re- that happened recently, and well, since Stormlight is get is getting a is getting an RPG adaptation, he's going to be overseeing that because he is very hands on with that with that sort of thing, which I actually re- I actually respect. That, that'll Except- be cool. I he's the perfect person to do that. Well, he, he's already he's already done the sort of overseeing before with the Mistborn RPG that Crafty put out. He, oh, okay. He had he had oversaw everything and would and would put in little asides in the book proper to give his perspective on certain mechanics or the method to madness things. You know the the kind of under the hood excerpts that are in some games. Right. Right. I but, wonder if Shay knows about that because he's he was a he's a huge well. In the past, has been a huge Sanderson fan, but he Shay, uh, who's who's on our the Feet First Discord, introduced me to 
Warriors and with Mistborn. Yeah. I wonder if he knows there's an RPG. Um, it's been it's been around for a while, but what are you shooting for as far as the total page count for inheritors? Uh, so I'm not shooting. I know I know what it is. It's it's one of two variants. It's either about 185 pages with a confidence interval of plus or minus three pages, and that's the book that's being pitched as the core rule book on Kickstarter. If I add this campaign supplement to it, that's going to boost it to something like 225 to 230 pages. Um, and, and a lot of that additional stuff is because it's a DM-free narrative campaign. So there are it's basically a choose-your-own-adventure between the action scenes. So you're, you're playing out your round, you check the choose-your-own-adventure stuff, There's some it's basically paragraphical, um, but that leads to some page bloat. But the nice thing is you, nobody has to do setup. You just show up and play. And we've run those with feet first into hell, and uh, for the for the two campaign modules that were that were pushed out, I tried two different models. One was kind of a choose your own, pick your own mission, but it wasn't super narrative based. And then the other one, Rain Hell, it uses this exact model. And the feedback from players was that they preferred the choose your own adventure model from from the Rain Hell supplement. So I'm wor- I have been working on this campaign supplement for a while. Um, it's just. It's a fairly large addition uh, to the book, and I'm just not. I, I'm, I don't want to promise something that I'm not confident that I can deliver, which is really how I ran the Kickstarter campaign. Like we've been working on this game for two years officially, although it, it's older than that, just not in this particular completely divorced from D and D form. It's really close to four years old, but two years ago was when I really started compiling all the information in the first of the Google Google Docs folders and then showing showing my buddies that we that we game with or D&D and, and with Warhammer and saying like okay first of all am i crazy mm-hmm. and then it kind of unfolded yes. from there the answer to the answer to the question is yes you're a game designer <laughs> yes <laughs> yeah accidentally uh well to 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 well to quote Alice in Wonderland we're all mad down here that's what it feels like down in the basement where we play, mm-hmm. but it's not fun. Well, at the very at the very least, it's not it's not like it's not like people are being tortured by playing Jenga or something. Yes, I consider Jenga to be a form of torturing non-combatants. <laughs> no, I, I think I think my buddies have fun because I I come up with ideas and they show up and they break them, and sometimes the breaking is way more fun than the original intent. Yeah, I can com- I can completely understand that. Oh, but I will certainly be looking forward to seeing how to seeing how it develops. But with all that said, I do want to sincerely thank you for taking the time out of your schedule to come all the way to my temple and enjoy the madness that happens here. Mm-hmm. And anytime you see fit to return, the door is always open. As I often say around here, drinking is not mandatory. But it is encouraged. I did have my very rare school night beer. Mm-hmm. It was pretty good. Nice little treat. I, I thank you for letting me come on and talk about the game. Mm-hmm. A lot of times, we you know we operate in, in fair, more or less silence, and my spouse doesn't really understand what the hell I'm doing down here. She's been my guinea pig for years now, but when it comes to like the madness, a little bit on my own when when I don't have a game session with my friends lined up. So I appreciate having this chance to unpack it and explain it to somebody who it's fresh to. Mm-hmm. It's, it's, it's really, really nice of you to offer, offer me the opportunity. Oh, yeah. And, of course, a sincere thanks goes out to everyone who took the time out of their schedule to come onto the show and enjoy the madness. And there will be plenty more where that came from, as there always is here, on the open bar of the Internet. But until then, on behalf of the good brothers present and not present, my name is Mildra, I am your gaming monk, Stay fucking frosty, everybody!